I am a politician. I say that out loud because I want people to get used to the idea that being a politician is a good thing. But I also am a teacher. I taught school for 30 years. And I say that out loud for the exact same reason, because too many people think being a teacher is not a good thing and discourage their kids from being teachers and likewise discourage their kids from being politicians. And for every teacher out there, you need to run for office if you don't like what's going on. You really need to think about this. Because teachers, I, and it, teachers said it when I was teaching, just let me go into my classroom and close my door and leave me alone. Well, that's not working out for us so well now, is it? Because what's happened to us is because of politics. And since I am the mutant of both of those, I thought I'd share with you today through pictures and commentary what I think all of this means for transforming education. Because I have been on a transformative path for a very long time, having grown up in Arkansas. That's my little town. You might think of Arkansas as a little state, and I've even had somebody ask me in an airport, about Arkansas. Now, what state is that in? I go, okay, we need to work on education here, people. But Arkansas is a small state. It's a state in the South. It's a state that so many people left when I was growing up. But I decided, because things were changing, Ken Robinson and I could have shared, I guess, that whole love child thing in the, in the 60s because we're approximately the same age. We just didn't meet. But so... It, and now, now we have, so what? Um, but, but the thing of it is, in Arkansas, it was tough. We were going through integrating schools. I was one of those kids integrating a school. And when I did, when I had that, that opportunity, and when I had that challenge of doing that, I knew there was really something wrong with the way we were doing school because I'd been to an all-black school for up through the ninth grade. And my school was good. The things that we mentioned, that we talked about, we played and we did lots of things. But because the schools were separated, and this was a political, social decision that we made, and because those schools were separated, I thought there surely had to be something so much better in that other school where I was not allowed to go in Willisville, population 188. However, when I was there, it was 209. So, you know, we were a metropolitan city then. Um, but when I did go to this other school, and I found out it wasn't even as good as the school I was in, I didn't know what the words were necessarily, but I knew there was something vastly wrong with what we were doing. So that is really kind of the thing that set me on this whole thing about transformation. Will I go forward? Oh, there we go. So I have just spent my life thinking about what I can do with kids like this. How can I empower kids to be a part of this change that we need? That is a picture inside the Capitol on the Senate floor. When kids come to the Capitol, especially from my district, I love to take them inside the Capitol so they will know this is their building as well. And when you look at those kids, you might well know these are not the kids from the most well-heeled parts of Little Rock, Arkansas. But I want them to feel the power just as I want their parents to feel the power if we're going to transform schools. And oftentimes, this is their first trip to the Capitol. They're not really sure why we're sitting on the floor, but I tell their teachers to tell them later and make sure they understand. This is another picture from the Capitol. This is the day we were holding a ceremony to honor Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday, where we had kids in the Capitol talking to us about what their dreams are about school. And it's important to hear their dreams and to hear their ideas about what they want to have happen in their worlds. And this little girl was, there were many of them who were good, but she was just so spectacular, she'll be glad to know she was at UCLA. <laughs> that little girl right there is my granddaughter. 
She is six years old and as fierce as they come. But one thing she knows for sure is that she has people supporting her. She goes to a school where almost everybody in that school is black or brown, a few white kids. She could be someplace else. But it just so happens her family, her extended family, and all of us don't believe it's in the interest of everybody to run away from the school where she is when we know she's going to be okay because all of us are there. And if anything transformative is going to happen and be sustained in our schools, it's the responsibility of politicians and parents and grandparents like me to remain there, not run away. Which is the very same reason I chose not to run away from Arkansas. Is there another Southerner in the room today? Am I it? Well, there was somebody here from Miami at one point, so that was kind of encouraging. We, uh, uh, Ken Robinson mentioned PISA and what's happening in all these other countries. So as a legislator, as a liberal Democrat, and yeah, they do happen in Arkansas, we're there. Uh, and I do own this in Arkansas. I, I've been referred to in Arkansas as a last standing liberal. That might have some validity. Um, but what we decided to do, the PISA scores came out, and everybody's talking about the PISA scores. This was in 2012. And you have legislators. Everybody in here does. So your legislator, whether it's your senator or a representative, is a member of something called the National Conference of State Legislators. Everyone is a member. We have education committees and uh, committees on judiciary, just as we do kind of set up back in our states. So when the, when the results came out in 2012 and there was all this discussion about it, I happened to be the chair along with a Republican friend um, of, of that committee. And so we talked the National Conference into and made a proposal to them. Let's take a look at what these other high-performing countries are doing and so that when we talk to our own colleagues about what's happening in other countries that we might could learn from, we will have a study because whether they're going to read them or not, legislators like to have studies. So we took almost 18 months taking a look at the 10 highest performers then according to PISA. And our notion was to find out, not for them to tell us what to do, but are there some things they're doing in common across those 10 highest performers? Not that we had to do everything we found out, because we decided we were going to report only those things we found in common across all 10. So somebody asked this morning about research. So the research is out there. Difficult to get anybody to do anything about it, but these will be the same people who will tell you, we need to, we need to compete on the world stage. It's a report that is written to be accessible to educators, but most especially to legislators, because we know we're not going to read a great deal of everything. This is Central High School. I commend that report to you. It's easy to read. This is Central High School, which played a big part and still plays a big part in my unrelenting desire for transformation. That school was built in 1927. We were talking about creativity, and somebody had a notion of what that school would look like. It was called the most beautiful school in the country when it was built. And some of you might not know the history of Central High School, but you need to if you're going to understand where we've been and how we need to get to where we are trying to go. Because in 1954, you probably know about Brown versus Topeka. 1954. No, we're not kidding. You have to integrate schools and, and, and other places. Central High School became ground zero. I was starting first grade when the attempt was made in 1957 for the school to be integrated. And rather than say we're going to integrate these schools, 
then the governor and others decided that we will just have soldiers here and keep the black kids out who were trying to integrate these schools. It's been a long road for Central High School and integration in the South that has had ripple effects every place else. In September of this year, toward the end of the month, Central High School had a commemoration for the 60th anniversary of that attempt. 60 years ago, when kids were turned away, and that is not the slide I want, but, oh, that's my granddaughter right there, straight out of pre-K. <laughs> These are kind of out of order, so I'll find them. She will be so pleased that I did that, but not quite so much. Um, but it was, it, was 60 years, it was 60 years ago today, and I can talk to you through the rest of this. It was 60 years ago today when, when Central was, was uh, attempted to be integrated. And so those students were turned away, and then we were commemorating today, uh, uh, on this day, what happened, and looking at the progress, and what else do we have to do? And the progress was not much to talk about when you think about where we are. Because as we sit here today, the State Board of Education in Arkansas is contemplating whether or not it is going to return that school to the people of Little Rock, Arkansas, because it's under state control. That's how much progress that has not been made. That's been the journey I've traveled to get to where I am now to think about communities as transformative vehicles, not just schools. Communities have to be what's transformed, I believe, because I have yet to see a school that has had a great track record, transformed, really reformed for a few years, but inevitably, it goes back to what it was when we don't have the community, community commitment. I don't know how they voted today. I haven't even decided to look. I didn't want to know before I talked to you because I didn't want to cry in front of you if they said no. So that's happened in, in this whole uh, effort of getting toward doing something that's right for education. But as a politician, I decided, since we've, dis we've chosen testing over educating, what can I do as a policymaker to try to put some policies in place to make sure education is returned to people who know what to do with it when they have it? I taught for 30 years and I still miss teaching because I got to do what I wanted to and needed to as a teacher. And sometimes just because I said that doesn't make sense, I'm not doing it. You have to have in your gut and in your brilliance as a teacher, you, you have to have the capacity and you have to, have to have the confidence that you are the professional here. And you have to act on it. But I know for a lot of educators, that's difficult to do and it's frightening, especially when you think about the politics of it all. So I introduced legislation, I work with the ASCD, the Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development, because they started this whole child, whole community initiative. And I started working with them and looking at what they were doing in 2008. So when I went to the Senate in 2009, I knew this had to be a gradual process, because my idea is we're going to become whole child, whole community places. I was able to get a resolution passed. That's not as hard to do, but it's a way of starting a conversation. That was in 2009. So 2011, we were still talking about this some. 2013, I introduced legislation because I had this idea that if we are going to hold people accountable, I think we need to widen that sphere of people that we're holding accountable. And some of the people I wanted to hold accountable were people who look like me, like as you were part of the report card as well. It was the hardest thing in the world to do because one person even said to me, I was trying to turn our schools into communist places and I was trying to take kids. But the legislation basically was about uh, setting up a mechanism by which 
we could give communities the information it takes to become a whole school, whole, uh, school, whole community place. So if it were about the whole community, these are the things that were, that were in the bill. We're going to set these things up that if you guarantee that kids have all of this, then they're probably going to be okay. And these were the tenets that were, you don't need to try to read that, so just look up here. You just look up here, because I gave up on that. Uh, these were the tenets, though, that if we were going to be a whole child, whole community, these are the things that would need to be true in your community. They've changed a bit now because ASCD has changed them some. But here is what, here's what we incorporated. If every child in the community had healthy options, if every child were safe, had active engagement, had adult support, didn't have to be their parents, had an intellectually stimulating environment, if they had these things, these would be the core tenets of what it would mean for a child not to have to depend on everything to happen at the school, but it would happen in the community as well. Be a whole child, whole community. Now, who is going to be accountable for this? Start out with educators, parents, community members, and everybody was happy so far, because listen to this list. Everybody is okay if it's educators. Everybody is okay if it's parents, parents in most cases. And community, mem community members was left broad because I wanted to be all kind of community members. But the last one I put on the list was policymakers that we would be held accountable to. That is, if we had not done what we should do, elected or appointed, then people would know that too and we could improve ourselves. And we almost, we almost had this made, and almost thought, we thought we were about to get to the point where we were gonna have this mechanism for doing this, and it just didn't work out. And I think mainly because of political reasons I can't go into because we're short on time. But I think it can be done. And I know it won't be done within the political arena unless you get involved because what I lacked, what I needed was not just that I had the idea. I needed educators. I needed parents. I needed communities supporting me because it cannot happen if it's just going to be one or two politicians who have the idea and even get legislation passed. If after that, I even went so far to get a, a bill passed called Schools of Innovation or Districts of Innovation because I knew if we were going to have a whole child, whole community, we needed to have people have the, the, the opportunity to not be held to just what we wanted them to do as politicians, but what the bill allowed people to do was just, as we say in the South, bust open and use all of your great creativity and create this kind of school you want and not be bound by politics. And because there were other ideologues and more money who didn't necessarily like that, the next thing you know, we have a bill that's passed that undercut that as well. So if we want whole child, whole communities, and I think we must have them, the thing that might seem obvious about that, if we want them, we have to act as whole communities to get them. Every politician is not there to make your life awful. Most of the time, they make bad decisions because you don't step up and tell us what the good decisions are. And that's important for you to remember. You have to get involved in politics if nothing else, run for office and join people like me. Thank you.